Scattered around in the sand are thousands of chunks of strange yellow-green glass. It is really, really a mysterious glass, and we scientists are still kind of puzzled how these things formed. The ancient Egyptians knew of this extraordinary place, but for thousands of years, it's remained unexplained. Now, a group of scientists plans to finally solve this mystery. It will take them on a journey from the depths of the desert to the Cairo Museum and the test site of the world's first atomic bomb. And what they reveal may pose an unsuspected threat to us all. What I want to emphasize is that it's hugely bigger in energy than the atomic test, 10,000 times more powerful. Heading for the Great Sand Sea of the Egyptian Sahara Desert, a team of scientists is on a mission. Their aim? To discover why tons of a most unusual glass are lying in the middle of the desert. One of the scientists, American physicist Mark Boslow, thinks he may at last have come up with the answer. It's a scientific mystery because it's unique. We don't know exactly what the process was that caused the creation of the glass. We know it's a natural phenomenon, and therefore it requires a natural explanation. Uh, it may be uh, a very unusual event, but it's certainly not a mystery that can't be solved. Working with colleagues, Boslow has developed a dramatic new theory to explain how the mysterious glass was produced. He has a terrifying vision of what happened here. Now, for the first time, Boslo is in the desert to see the site for himself. He is hoping to find the final pieces of evidence to complete his theory. I've been reading about this place for the last 20 years. There's only so much time you can spend sitting behind a computer looking at tables of numbers. That gives you a good quantitative idea, but it doesn't really give you intuition. To, to develop that intuition, I, I really think it's important to go out in the field and, and have a look. Joining him are geologist Ali Barakat and geochemist Christian Kerbel, who, like Barakat, is an old desert hand. They have spent years studying the mysterious event which must have taken place in the desert. We scientists have been interested in these desert glasses for a very long time because they are very different from any other natural glass that we know. It's just such a mysterious glass. Yes, Barakat is Egypt's desert glass expert and has traveled to the area several times. You must go to the south and go to the north. I know the area like my finger. But there Barakat's interest dates back to 1998 and a remarkable discovery he was involved in. It took place in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Hidden away in a dark corner of the Tutankhamun exhibition was a necklace made of different colored gems. At its center was an intriguing yellow-green carved scarab. It was said to be chalcedony, a semi-precious stone. But mineralogists were not so sure. Surrounded by armed guards and officials, Barakat and his colleague, Vincenzo de Micheli, were allowed to examine and test the jewel. And the tests revealed that the scarab was not a semi-precious stone. In fact, it was made of glass. But it was not a glass like any other produced by the ancient Egyptians.
Barakat had an idea where the glass came from. He knew of a 10th century Arabic book with a map inside, which showed the location of a large mineral deposit in the Egyptian Sahara Desert. And on the map, he describes the Mediterranean Sea in the north and the Red Sea to the east and the Nile River and uh, the pyramid. And far out in the desert, the book describes a mineral it calls peridot. Peridot is a greenish yellow gem, but Barakat had never heard of peridot being found in this part of the desert. I am very happy because I found this, uh, this passage and this book because he recorded for the first time uh, the strange material. Barakat guessed that the Arabs had discovered the source of the glass in Tutankhamun's necklace. What's more, he thought he had seen some pieces of the same glass. In the geology museum where he worked, there were samples of glass brought back from this part of the Sahara by an English explorer. In 1932, Patrick Clayton reported that far out in the desert, he had discovered chunks of glass scattered over thousands of square kilometers of desert. He had no idea how it had got there, but he brought back some samples. Since the discovery of Tutankhamun's jewel, Several scientific teams have traveled into the Sahara to try to find answers to explain the origin of this unusual glass. Barakat and his team are the latest to make the journey out to the glass area. It's a long, hard journey through the desert. It will take them at least three days driving and three freezing nights before they can even start looking for any glass. Over the years, scientists have been struggling to find an explanation for how this unusual natural glass ended up in such a huge area of the Sahara. Compared to some of the other glasses that we have in nature, these are really interesting because they are clear, they have a color and this pure silica composition that makes them really unique in the world. We know no other natural glasses that look like this or have a composition like this. And so uh, we scientists are still kind of puzzled how these things formed. The puzzle for the scientists is that the desert glass is not like any other natural glass found on Earth. Most natural glass is volcanic in origin. Volcanic glass forms when hot, molten magma solidifies rapidly, usually when it meets cold water. Volcanic glass is relatively common, but its chemical composition and dark color are quite unlike the desert glass. Over the years, there have been a few bizarre theories trying to explain what it's doing in the desert. One idea suggests this area was once swampy and that the glass was left behind as sediment when the swamp dried up. A key aspect of this theory is that the glass formed slowly at low temperatures. But Christian Kerbel had some doubts. When I first heard about this idea, I thought, well, it's an interesting one that it forms at low temperature but I wasn't quite convinced that the desert glass really formed this way. I thought, well, maybe there is a way we can find out if it formed in a high temperature or if it formed in a low temperature. Kerbel turned for help to the Natural History Museum in Vienna, whom he's worked closely with in the past. Using their electron microscope, he searched the desert glass for a mineral called zircon. 
Zircon is remarkably stable, but starts to break down at high temperatures. Kerbal looked for zircon crystals that have begun to disintegrate. And what this tells me is that the glass formed at a very short time and a high temperature. And to understand exactly which temperature we're looking at here, I need to analyze the different bits inside here. As the zircon disintegrates, it forms light and dark patches. In the dark patches, the zircon has broken down into a form of silica. The amount of zircon left in these areas shows how far the disintegration has progressed and indicates the temperatures reached. In the darker areas, we have less zircon and more silica. And what this tells us is that this little zircon crystal has decomposed partly because of the high temperature, but not completely. And the ratio of the two elements tells me that the temperature was about 1,800 degrees Celsius. 1,800 degrees Celsius is hot, incredibly hot. Volcanic lava is only about 1,100 degrees Celsius. Whatever happened here in the desert, the heat required to produce the glass was phenomenal. What Kerbal found convinced him and everybody else that they had to look for another explanation. There was only one thing they knew of that could create such a staggeringly high temperature that it melted the ground. <laughs> 